have a battery and it needs charging. No, so we I, we're, good, we're good, we're good. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you tonight. We praise you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Father, for Psalm 19. And Lord, we're excited for all that you have for us this evening. And Father, we thank you once again for your precious Holy Spirit, who is always our teacher, always our guide, every week. And Lord, we just are, um, again, Lord, we're just excited about your word tonight. In Jesus' name, we all agree. Amen. Amen. Okay, I know you're already there, Psalm 19. And um, who's the author of Psalm 19? David. David, yes. All right. I mean, who doesn't love Psalm 19, right? <clears throat> And David is the author. It's wonderful. And, of course, he begins the whole psalm by this declaration, and he's declaring that God has revealed himself to man in nature. And, of course, this is the same David in Psalm 8 <laughs> that said these words, Lord, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, you've placed them there, you've established them there, and this is David. And, of course, David being a shepherd guy, right, <laughs> he was out there in those fields, the fields of Bethlehem, all the time. And every night he was looking up. Where? Into the sky, at the stars, looking at the heavens. And so he had much to say about nature, about the heavens, about the stars and the moon. And so here, this is that same David that starts the whole Psalm 19 with the words that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. And handiwork there is the work of his fingers. And that's actually in Psalm 8 as well, the work of his fingers. I love that. Now, in the New Testament, we also see Paul picking up on this as well in Romans chapter 1. And you know your Romans, right? <laughs> but in Romans 1, verses 19 and 20, Paul declares there something very similar to what David declares here. And he says, Paul says there in Romans, that those things that can be known about God are clearly revealed in his creation, that God has revealed himself through creation, and that's Romans 1, Paul the Apostle, verses 19 and 20. Same idea, same thing that Paul picks up on there. And so what do we know about creation? Creation can absolutely, and it does absolutely, tell us so many wonderful things about God. We can look at creation just simply going outside and looking at the night sky, looking up, looking at the universe, and just being blown away. And anybody can look at it just in a logical, rational way. Just looking at it, just, just me, just somebody that, you know, no big fat education, no really, you know, nothing, no scientific real knowledge, but just logically, simply just looking up into the sky, rationally and logically, and what can it reveal? It reveals some wonderful things about God. And I love what Pastor Chuck says here. He says, the problem with man is that Man, for the most part, when he observes nature, he observes it irrationally. And that's the sad thing. And he hits the nail on the head with that. Man usually observes nature irrationally. And so here in verse 1, it declares the heavens declare the glory of God. That is, the heavens speak to us. They talk to us. That's what it's saying. The heavens talk to us about the glory of God. When we look up into that night sky and we look at the stars and we look at the planets and we see the moon, how amazing that is, right? As one person said, I love how one commentator put it. He said, as you look up into the night sky and see the stars and the planets, if you will just listen, just listen, they will declare to you, the very glory of God. And I thought, isn't that a wonderful quote? And I don't know if he said it that way, but as I look at those words, I get real quiet. <laughs> because at nighttime, if you're out in the wilderness and you're looking at that sky and you're away from everybody anyway, you're away from the lights, you're away from the hubbub, you're away from the busyness, and it's quiet, it's even more powerful. Because it's like there's no noise. And you're seeing these big diamonds in the sky. And you just, you're in awe. You're in awe of all that, right? I am. It's just the most wonderful thing. And so what are we seeing when we do that? We're seeing the vastness of God. 
We're seeing the hugeness of who he is. We're seeing, actually, we're looking at, and it's declaring to us, the incredible power and might of Almighty God. Because what? Because he created those babies up there, right? Every, and there's so many of them. I mean, we can see so many of them with our naked eye, but really, we're, it's just, we're just scratching the surface, right? Because of how many stars there are in the whole universe. And so what are we really looking at? We're looking at the, the bigness of God, right? <laughs> and the power that there is an entity, almighty God, a person, almighty God, who actually created those things out of nothing. And by his word, actually, there's one verse, and I should have written down the reference because I was reading it earlier today. There's one verse that talks about how that the stars and the moon were created by his breath. By his breath. <laughs> you know, I thought, oh, you know. And then he established, actually, we know that it says that in one part, portion of the Hebrew, it almost denotes that he, he flung them. But he flung them with a purpose to where it, they were established and ordained in that spot. And then he called them by name. And the Bible tells us that not one of them is missing. <laughs> I just love the word. Isn't that cool? He created them. He made them. He placed them. He named them. <laughs> and not one of them is, is missing. <laughs> he, has tra he, make, he keeps track of every one of them. And so when you look up there on that black velvety sky and on it is all these diamonds, big diamonds and little diamonds and all these planets and stars and orbits of which I know very little. But when I get into it, I get really excited. I get really Pentecostal and I start praising God, right? Even though I don't know a whole lot scientifically. But you know, you don't have to, do you? Just simply look at it. And what does it declare? The glory of God, the bigness of God, the vastness of Almighty God. It talks about his power. It denotes his, his, his might, how big he is and how wonderful our God is. I mean, this is what we're looking at when we look at that night sky and that nature in general. It speaks to us, right? I love that. And so the heavens declare the glory of God, verse 1. And the firmament shows the work of his fingers. His fingers. Don't you just love that? It's the work of his fingers. I just, I just get blown away at the way this whole psalm is worded, right? Day after day utters speech, and night after night shows knowledge. Now, pick up on the wording here. Just look at the wording. Each word is so perfectly placed in his perfect word, as we're going to look at here in a couple seconds. It's perfect day after day. It utters to us. It speaks to us. Night after night, it shows knowledge. How beautiful is that? Now listen to this. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. So what is that? what's that talking about? The, he's talking about the voice of nature. That nature has a voice. And that nature has, okay, it's got a voice. And he's also saying here that it is a universal language that it has. It's universal. In other words, you can go to any place on this earth, any place on the globe, any cultural group, any enclave, in any jungle that we've never heard of or know very little about, any place on, on, on planet earth where there are people and societies and cultures, no matter how primitive, they might look or we might think of them and we can go to any place guaranteed and when you get there, no matter where they're at, there is going to be a natural belief in a supernatural being. Every single culture, no matter how Sometimes, you know, <laughs> in, in these, you know, in, in, in America and in industrialized nations, we think we're so good, right? We're so smart. We've come so far, you know? And so when we think about those other cultures, we think, oh, we're so much smarter than they are, <laughs> you know? And, oh, look how they dress, you know? And there's, they don't wear clothes right. They don't have any clothes on, from the waist up and all these kind of things, little criticisms. Let me tell you something. Every place you go, every culture, they believe in a supernatural being. Every culture, every place. And so, now, now granted, <laughs> we've got to clarify a little bit. The details of those belief systems can be a little messed up. We know that, right? <laughs> because they're worshiping the star. 
They're worshiping the moon. They're worshiping the trunk of that tree. Or they're worshiping the gnat or the fly. You know, they're worshiping <laughs> whatever. But they still believe that there's a supernatural <clears throat> being. And so no matter where you go, you see, you see it. And, and so sadly, they're, they're worshiping that thing, that star, that planet, that tree. And that is because, again, like Chuck said, I love that quote, man looks at nature irrationally. Many times, most of the time, man looks at nature irrationally. Because see, it isn't rational to look, say, at a tree, maybe that's you know, bearing fruit, maybe a banana tree or an apple tree or whatever kind of tree. And you look at that tree and man, you open up that piece of fruit and there's those seeds in there. And those seeds, if you, if you take those seeds or they just kind of fall out or if you take them and you plant them or they fall on their own and they just kind of get kind of mushed up under the dirt and then it rains and then a, another little thing spring, springs up. And oh my gosh, it's another tree. And then that tree grows up and then there's more fruit. I see, it's, see to look at that and, and to look at something so beautiful in creation, and this is what happens sometimes with people that are looking at it irrationally, perhaps in some of those groups we just mentioned, and they look at that and they see the brilliant design of all of that, and they sit there and they're, they're wondering at it and they're, they're mystified by it and they're, they're thinking, wow, this is incredible, and then they sit there and they begin to worship that tree. And said, oh, mighty tree, oh, you know, mighty thing. You know, see, that's, that's not logical, is it? Is that logical? That's not logical to think that that tree created itself. It's irrational, right? And so the rational way, the logical way to observe nature is to see it and to marvel at it and to get excited about it and, and just enjoy it and, and watch it and just get so in awe and wonder at the glory of that design and then to worship the God who had such wisdom. Wisdom itself, God is. He is wisdom. And then to worship God who had such wisdom and designed it exactly perfectly that way. That's the way to look at nature. That's how nature declares the glory. We're to look at nature that way. And so what happens oftentimes with most of mankind is that they'll stop short of that, won't they? And so many times they'll stop short. And as Paul says, also in Romans, he talks about how that they stop short of worshiping the creator. And what did he say? They worship the creation. They serve the creation instead of the creator. And so, see, that's the illogical way of man, isn't it? And Paul hit the nail on the head, and he kind of picks up it. This goes hand in hand with where we're at here in Psalm 19. And so we, and really, modern man, same exact thing, same exact thing. Now, we don't live in a jungle, but we're modern man, and we live in, you know, we have modernization and all of the things that we have in our country and in our culture and in our society. But we still see people today stopping short and they'll worship material things okay we're not sitting in the jungle and we don't have a bunch of ivy around us and we don't have coconuts falling on our heads and we're not wearing loincloths none of that but we're doing the same thing aren't we overall i'm talking about mankind where we'll, we'll sit there and you see it all the time in society and they worship material things man-made things sometimes they'll worship a god-made thing but they're doing it illogically and they'll worship a, they'll worship material things and so they're worshiping the the temporal the material and they're they're um in, instead of instead of like taking that next step and then worshiping the god that made that thing or better yet worshiping the god who gave that person that created that thing the brain to create it because see all of the things that we have the high-tech stuff i mean when you think of the computer and the internet and everything that we have now that we didn't have what I know when I was a young person, we didn't have an iPhone. We didn't have anything. We didn't have a computer, no nothing, right? And now to see how far all of these scientific things have come and then to sit down and, and, and it, that's what man does. You know, we, we get so into what we have and then that worship, that syndrome, we don't call it worship, you know, but we just so esteem those things and we, we hold it, you know, in our, it's just so delightful to us and, and really we're worshiping those things, man in general, correct? And so instead of, doing, instead of doing what we should do, which is the logical thing, which is saying, Lord, 
we are so blessed to have all this techno technology. And Lord, thank you that you gave some guys the smarts. You, you create, who created the brain that invented the computer chip? God did. God created that. I mean, it always goes back to the Lord, doesn't it? Medical science, the stuff that they're coming out with now, some of the things out of Israel, I'm just blown away about the, the devices and the inventions that they're um, inventing and, and putting into the human body that enables a paraplegic to actually stand and take steps for the first time ever. It's like, whoa, where'd that come from? You know where it came from? From a brain that God created. And wisdom that God gave. And so here, just not stopping short, but remembering who's behind all of these beautiful things that we have. Whether it's nature declaring the, the glory of God, or it's scientific um, things that we have. Material things that are wonderful and great to have and to enjoy. Listen, it's God that actually gave that knowledge and that wisdom. So here, how important it is that we don't stop short of worshiping um, the creator. We don't want to worship the creation and not worship the creator rather than the creator, Paul said. Very, very um, just beautiful kind of um, simultaneous passages there with Romans 1 and Psalm 19. I love that. And so there's no speech, there's no language where their voice is not heard. You can go anywhere in the globe and you can find that the heavens declare the glory of God. Now he goes on with this same line of thought and he says their line is gone out through all the earth and their words, now are you catching this language? Their word, it's speaking to us. See the language? Their words, I love that. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them has he set a tabernacle for the sun. I love that. Now, there's some beautiful language here, some beautiful language. And I know you guys probably have already noticed it. It's almost like poetry. It's almost like, it just, it feels like, um, I don't just like the lyrics to a song almost. I mean, he's just describing, he's just talking about the sun here, right? Now listen to what he says, I love this. He says, well, first he talks about the other stuff. Their line has gone out through all the earth, their words to the end of the world. Doesn't that sound like a song? To the end of the world, their words go. <laughs> I love it. In them has he set a tabernacle for the sun. I love that. Which is like a bridegroom. It's like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run a race. Isn't that poetic? Don't you think that sounds poetic? I do. I think it sounds like a, just a beautiful lyric of some kind. In other words, every day, the sun itself, it makes its race through the sky, doesn't it? it and you know, it, it cracks me up. We're looking at the same sun that Adam saw, the same sun <laughs> that Abraham looked at. We're looking at the same moon <laughs> that Jacob looked at. We're looking at the same planets that Esther looked at, that Deborah and Jael looked at. We're looking at the same planets that God established them there. I mean, that in and of itself is like a, a glorious mind blower, right? I mean, we're, they've been there since the beginning of Genesis, and they're still there. And what does it look like? He looks, it looks like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run a race. They're still there, same ones. It's, it's kind of cool to think of when, if you want to go out at night and look at the moon and the stars or looking at the beautiful sunrise or a sunset or even at the, at the midday when it's just in all of its glory, the sun is right there in the middle of the sky. And you think, man, Abraham looked at the same sun. You know, how, how cool is that, right? David looked at the sun. I just, I love things like that. Just kind of taking a minute and pondering all of these things. So he, every day the sun makes its race through the sky, he says here. And then in verse six, I love this. I love this. Now, still talking about the sun. He says, his going forth. Now, see, he's even personalizing the sun. Did you catch that? That's why I feel like it's like a poem. Like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, rejoices like a strong man to run a race. His, his going forth is from the end of the heaven. And his circuit or his, another good word for that would be a revolution or an orbit. His orbit 
is, is to the ends of it, and there is nothing hidden from the heat of, of that sun. There's nothing, I mean, the, the, the sun hits everything, right? Every part of the world. I mean, it just, it's a glorious thing to stop and look at the language and then think about it. Think about these, these planets that this God Almighty of ours has created. I just love this. And so all of these beautiful um, descriptions. So all of nature, it declares the glory of God. But what do we know about man, poor man? <laughs> because man didn't properly... Um, hear the voice of God in all of that glorious nature and man began to kind of stop short and kind of he began to worship the creation rather than the creator guess what it was necessary for God Almighty to then speak more specifically than just nature it was then necessary for God to speak more specifically to man in order that he would be able to reveal himself and his will, thus God spoke to man through his word. Not just nature, but more specifically through his word. And that's what we get in verses 7 through 11 is God's word. God speaks to man now here in this psalm through his word. The nature, the creation, hallelujah, but now more specifically through his very word and so in verse 7 what does it say it says the law the word statutes word ordinances we're going to see this when we get to psalm 119 as well but the law of the lord the word of the lord is perfect now specifically here law is torah it's the first five books of the bible genesis exodus leviticus numbers and deuteronomy now david here <laughs> did not have the gospels he didn't have Proverbs, his son Solomon wasn't born yet, right? He didn't have the New Testament, didn't have the epistles. When he talks about the law and the word of God being perfect, he's just talking about the Torah. That is perfect. And so this is what he's talking about here. Think about that as, as we're reading through here. The law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul, the testimony, another word for the word of God, the testimony of the Lord is sure making wise the simple david says here and so he says here the law of the lord is perfect the torah is perfect he says it's perfect now i just i just stuck for a minute today and just kind of repondered that god's word is perfect it's just perfect <laughs> it's just perfect now i have had the best last few days ever <laughs> because Friday morning, you know, they're ahead of us by a few lessons. Guess what Friday morning was on? It was on the lesson having to do with Psalm 119. What is Psalm 119 about? All about the word, right? So I started out on Friday morning talking about Psalm 119, which is my favorite psalm, and it truly is my favorite psalm. I'll, talk, I'll tell you about that later when we get to Psalm 119. But I began the weekend, Friday morning, Psalm 119, and then Friday night, <laughs> we were in the inductive Bible study. All day Saturday, we were talking about the Word of God again, right? <laughs> and then, of course, Dan was here yesterday morning. And then tonight, what do we have? Psalm 19, talking about the Word of God. So I have, like, been in, like, total heaven. I want to call it honey heaven because it's sweet to my taste. It's like been so glorious this whole weekend, right? It's just amazing. But here, David just, he just says this simple thing. The word of the Lord is perfect. It's just perfect. Now there's only about one other thing that I might say that about and that would be my grandkids. They're just perfect. They're perfect. They're, don't talk to me. I don't want to hear it. They're just perfect, right? <laughs> They're just perfect. I'm sorry. So the word of the Lord is perfect. And then right here, my grandkids are perfect. <laughs> but God's word, I love what he says here. It's just perfect. It's perfect. And you know, it's perfect for everything, isn't it? Now we're going to talk about here, he goes down, there's a little progression here. Did you guys catch it? I know you did. But there's a progression here, right? And I love this. First of all, first of all, he just says it's flat perfect. <laughs> I love that. God's word is perfect. And then he says it converts the soul, I love that. It converts the soul. Remember when we were going through First and Second Peter, and I was in my kitchen, remember, with all the dishes behind me, and it was like, we were like, ah, oh, having to live stream. 
But remember, I love that portion of scripture there in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, because it talks about how the, it's the word of God that converts the soul, right? 1 Peter 1, verse 23, it says, that having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed, through, and I love that you guys, okay, we're just going to stop for a second on this verse, because I happen to love this verse. I just got so excited as I was writing it down. 1 Peter 1, 23 says this, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and it abides forever. Do you love that? I mean, just break that down and just take it word by word. It just gets, I mean, I just get excited, right? I mean, it's not corruptible. It's incorruptible. As David says here in Psalm 19, it's perfect. Incorruptible. Peter calls it incorruptible. David calls it what? Perfect. <laughs> it converts the soul. Peter reiterates that same thing in different words. It's perfect. It's not corruptible. It's incorruptible. It's the word of God, and it's alive. It lives, and it abides forever. Now, Paul, again, in Romans chapter 10, what does he say? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes how? The by the word of God. The seed of the word. It converts the soul. This book, we talk about it all the time, and I just have to say it again. I'm sorry, you guys, for repeating it. This book is completely alive. It is alive. Actually, Jesus is the living word. Amen? It's alive. He, says, he said to those um, uh, religious people, he goes, he goes, you know, you think you know the scriptures, but the scriptures, they speak of me. It's all about me. The scripture is the living word of God. Jesus, Jesus is the living word. And it's, that's the only thing that's going to make it through every stage of prophecy. Every stage that we have set before us. And it could be any second, right? <laughs> that all these things get underwear if you're watching the news. But I mean, this, is, this is the only thing that will go on and on and on and on. It's his word. It will last forever, and it's alive, and it converts the soul. See, that seed, it's a living seed. Seeds are alive, aren't they? Now, I have some seeds that I got years ago at Monticello, and I know that if I wanted to spread those out, even though they're years old, I would get some wildflowers from them because I've kept them in a cool spot. I mean, I just know that because in that seed, they have seeds that they found from what they call prehistoric days, but let me put the, thousands of years, and they planted them, and they sprouted, right? And so here, think of it that this seed is alive. It's the seed of the word, and it converts. It gives life. This is the seed of the word, and it gives life. What do we know about seeds, right? There's life in there. It gives life. It produces life. Well, this is spiritual. This is the spiritual seed of the word, and it converts the soul. How glorious is that? How glorious is that? It brings soul. As one person said, let me find the quote here. The soul that was in darkness, God's word brings into the light. See the power of the word? It brings life from death. It's perfect. It converts the soul of a man. I love that. This is what God's word will. This is why when we're witnessing and when we're sharing, a lot of times, because we do want to say the right thing. I, I know how everybody feels because I'm, I'm not the best evangelist. I always used to feel like that Roger was the evangelist and Andrew is more of an evangelist and I'm more of the, I'll pray over here for you guys, you know. But I, of course, we all share, right? But you do feel that, you know, that it's not a burden, but you feel that responsibility right that I want to say the right thing have you ever felt that when you're sharing with somebody it's like oh lord you know why didn't I mention why, why haven't I memorized the four spiritual laws forgive me God you know but really you know what if we just share the word even if we just know John 3 16 if we don't know anything else and you guys know a lot more than John 3 16 because I know you but even if we're sharing and we're talking with somebody about the Lord and we we just you know we're kind of nervous and we're, we're not sure if we're sharing the right thing you know and everything oh Lord help me help me and you know what if you can just stop and say you know 
Let me tell you something. God so loved this whole planet that he gave his only son. And then just go on and just quote it in the conversation. Do you know what? That is a powerful, the most powerful thing we can say is the word of God. Hey, God is love. They don't know where that is in the Bible. But I can say, I can say that very you know, easily. I might not even remember any of the references that I'm thinking of at the time, which I probably won't unless I had it written, written down, right? But you know what? You can just say it forth out of your heart. And see, it's the Holy Spirit that's prompting, right? Holy Spirit's prompting us. And then you say, you know what? God is just pure love. Have you ever heard, has anybody ever told you that God is just pure love? Has anybody ever told you that God just wants really great stuff for your life? They don't have to hear the whole thing, you know, that God has good plans for you and not for evil. Just say, you know, God has really good stuff in store for you. He has such a better plan for you than you could ever imagine because he loves you so much. He loves you supreme. Do you know that God loves you like nobody else is ever going to love you? See, all of those are verses. Every, everything that I just said are all verses. And see, that has power. And so as we put forth the seed of the word out there, just that pure word of God, whether we remember the these and the thous or whatever version, it doesn't even matter. Just, just say it. Say the truth of the word, and it will do that thing, God's word says and promises. It will do that thing that it was set forth to do. Holy Spirit will make sure of that. He'll make sure of that. Isn't that just wonderful? That kind of changes up our witness stuff. It kind of changes up the fear factor a little bit. I still get fearful probably. But it really gives that confidence. Because see, that's the word of God, right? This is the seed of the word. It will do that thing that God has set it forth to do. It won't come back void. It will do so. Even if, even if you don't see it then. You can say a verse to somebody and just nonchalantly in the, in the conversation, you don't have to give them chapter, just say the verse. And you know you're quoting the word. And you give them a little verse and they may not flinch. You might not see them flinch. And you'll go away and you'll think, man, that was, you know, that was not good. <laughs> that didn't end well. You know what's going to happen when they go to bed that night? The Holy Spirit's going to bring that back to them. And they're going to remember what you said. It's not what you said or me said. It's what the word said, right? Or the next day when they get fired or they get a demotion or the doctor gives them a bad report. You know, I've got bad news for you today. Guess what's going to pop back in their mind? That scripture that you gave them. Because see, it's alive. And see, God has a plan for that verse, and he sends it forth through you and through me, and it's going to do the thing that he set it forth to do, which is going to be all love, all comfort, all leading, all guiding for that poor person that doesn't know Jesus yet, right? It's the most sweet thing. I love it. I just love it how God's word is. See, it's alive. Hebrews says it's alive, it's powerful, and it's sharper <laughs> than any two-edged sword. So it is an amazing thing to share the seed of the, the word of God. And so here, David, he hits the nail on the head. He said it converts the soul. It converts the soul, and it does. And um, it's an amazing thing when we share just the word. So it convert. Now, notice the progression here. I know you guys have already noticed it. But the progression here is quite prominent. First of all, it says here in verse 7 that the, the word of God, the law, the Torah, the word, it converts the soul. And so first of all, what is there? Conversion, right? And then secondly, also in verse 7, it says that the testimonies of the Lord make wise the simple. Did you catch that? The testimony of the Lord, it, it makes wise the simple. It's sure. It makes it make, making wise the simple, it says here. And, of course, in Psalm 199, 119, verse 99, we just had this Friday morning, it tells us there that the word of God makes me, makes you wiser than your teachers and wiser than than the ancients and ancients there doesn't mean like ancient philosophers but it means the most elderly people among us that may have the most knowledge and experience that the word of god makes us wiser than our teachers now notice something there and we're gonna we'll go into this more in depth when we get to the that particular lesson it doesn't say smarter it says wiser the word of god makes us wiser 
than the ancients, wiser than our teachers. In other words, I know a lot of people that are brilliant people. And I, I'm always amazed. <laughs> I just want them to talk and I love to listen to them and I love that kind of stuff. And I know a lot of people that have a lot of knowledge and a lot of facts and they're, they're educated people, but they are foolish in their private lives. And they're unhappy <laughs> and they don't have wisdom. Because what is wisdom? Wisdom is, is how to use the knowledge that you have. Wisdom is it's like word of wisdom. It's like how to use that knowledge. It's like how to how to handle your life. How to, wisdom and education are not the same thing. And so God's word gives us more wisdom than our teachers. More wisdom than the I just love that. And so first of all, there's conversion. And then it says the word, the testimonies of the Lord, they're sure and they make wise the simple. I love that. And so in other words, once, once we've been converted, right? Then God, we've been converted. The word of God brings the, the seed of the word, brings the conversion. And then once we've been converted, then God's word begins to instruct us and to give us wisdom, and it makes wise all of us simple folk. Amen? <laughs> Joy Dawson, I love what Joy Dawson always says. She says, knowing the word of God makes you smart. <laughs> if you want to be smart, get into the word. We just talked about that, right, with the, with the inductive, and we're going to talk about, we're going to end up somehow in Psalm 1, and I know Dan uh, shared that as well. The blessings of the Word of God, the blessings that come to our life because of the Word of God. So it instructs us, it gives us wisdom, it makes wise the simple. I love that. And then next in the progression, it says the statutes of the Lord, verse 8, they're just right. Now see, that kind of reminds me of the other statement that David made, doesn't it? The Word of God is just perfect. It's right. It's perfect. <laughs> I love that. I'm not a I'm not the best person to like debate <laughs> because I just like say things and then I don't. Because you know, if you debate wisely, if you're, if you're a good debater, you're gonna have your details, you're gonna have that. When it comes to God's word, I don't have any wiggle room. <laughs> it's like perfect and it's right. And if you're not smart enough to believe that, if I'm sharing with somebody, it, it gets ugly sometimes because I get mad. <laughs> it's like, too bad, you wanna, be, you wanna go to hell? You can go to hell, that's up to you. But God's word is perfect, it's right, God loves you. Take it or leave it. It's up to you. <laughs> and see, that's why I don't, that's why I'm a poor evangelist. <laughs> but anyway, never mind. <laughs> but it does. It's the most wonderful thing. I know, I know. It's so true. I'm glad. Oh, well. <laughs> I wish I had something else to say, but I'm not going to say it. I'll get myself in trouble. But anyway, I just love it because it's, it's plain talk. God's word is perfect, and it's right. Amen, right? <laughs> I love that. I love it. I just love it. The statutes of the Lord are right rejoicing the heart i love that it rejoices our heart as and so we're converted hallelujah by the word of god the testimonies of the lord then they make us wise they instruct us they give us wisdom what they make wise the simple i love that and then as we begin to walk in the path of the lord we have this rejoicing in our heart right when we're born again, we're converted, and we're walking with the Lord, we have this joy, don't we? There's a rejoicing in our heart. And this is all a progression here, having to do with the word of God, converting the soul, making wise the simple, rejoicing the heart. Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 6, calls the word. I love it when he says, he says, the, the word of God is the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. Do you love that? I just love that. And, and Jeremiah is known as what? The weeping prophet. But he had one thing <laughs> that was the joy and the rejoice. And he didn't have any converts, did he? He didn't have somebody that came forward at an altar call to get excited about and joyful. Because nobody repented under him. They all just stayed bad news. And they all got carried off into captivity. Can you imagine not having one response? Not having one salvation what we would call salvation he didn't have any of that and yet he said about god's word he said it's the joy and the rejoicing of my heart in the middle of all that lamenting that jeremiah did he said the word of god is the joy and the rejoicing of my heart i love that and then he goes on in verse 8 with this progression so 
the, it, they're the rejoicing of our heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. I love that. And so what happens next is we walk with the Lord. The word causes us to see how God wants us to live. How does he want me to be? You know, and also he instructs us through the word, right? He enlightens our, our, our eyes to everything around us. You know, what kind of a wife does he want us to be? What kind of a mom does he want us to be? What kind of a grandmother does he want us to be? What kind of a worker does he want us to be? What kind of a homemaker does he want us to be? What kind of a student does he want us to be? What does he want from us? In other words, I like to phrase it this way. What pleases him? What, what, what can I, how, how can I, how can I live my life to please you? And see, the word of God, it shows us that. It instructs us how to please the Lord. I love that. Don't you want to please the Lord? So often I don't. So often I disappoint the Lord or I fail or I botch something up. I mean, I'm con I, nothing, you know, some, I was thinking about this today. You would think when you reach my age <laughs> that, you know, that you would like get things right. I, I'm still to this day, I'm learning lessons. I'm learning lessons, Jenny knows. I just learned a big lesson, right? <laughs> a big lesson, Andrew knows it too. And it's like, I thought to myself today when I was praying about I thought, Lord, I should have learned that already. And yet, you know what? The Lord enlightened my eyes through his word. Even though I'm stubborn, <laughs> you know, and I'm not always open to instruction, he enlightens our eyes. He shows us how to please him. I love that. Don't you want to know how to please him? I just want to know. And you know, you want to please the one you love. Amen? So how much we want to please him shows if we really love him, doesn't it? And so there's times when I failed him so miserably, and I think, oh, Lord, that was not pleasing to you. And then, you know, you just got to go back with 1 John 1, 9, right? And just get that washing and that cleansing. I mean, but I love that. It enlightens the eyes. The word causes us to see how God wants us to live, how we want, and not just how he wants us to live, what I constantly depend on the word of God for is that he shows us what his will is decision making right how do he I, man I'm constantly asking the Lord okay do you want me to do this or that how, yeah, am I supposed to do this now or later right I mean I'm constantly asking the Lord for that kind of guidance and see the word of God it enlightens our eyes to situations, to how we can please him, how to walk with him, how to do all. It, it's just a, an amazing, an amazing thing that God, God's word. And it's perfect. It's perfect, isn't it? And it's for everything, right? The word of God. And, and you know, too, I was thinking about this today. I thought, gosh, and I wish I would have had that, um, that copy. I have a quote. Maybe I'll, br I'll bring it um, when we do Psalm 119 lesson. But it's by Spurgeon. And it has this huge list that he gave inside of one of his sermons on just all the things that God's word does for us. You know, it walks with me. It talks with me. It cries with me. It rejoices with me. It's the most beautiful quote. So um, I'm going to find it and bring it on the night that we do the lesson uh, with Psalm 119. But God's word, it's perfect. It's perfect. It's right. <laughs> you know, and it does everything for us, right? I just love the word of God. And, you know, I can just, I'll tell you something. I can just be in the kind of a, just a not the best mood, and I can start looking at a verse or looking at a chapter, and I'll just read just a few verses, and my whole demeanor will change. My whole outlook changes because of the power of the word of God. It's the most amazing thing because it's a perfect book, and it's a wonderful book. So I love God's word. Amen, and I know you guys do too. <laughs> and then in verse 9, he talks about the fear of the Lord, the reverence of the Lord, right? The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. I love that. The reverence of the Lord. And do we ever live in an irreverent world? They don't have reverence for anything. There is no reverence for anything. I mean, now here, just talking about the reverencing of the Lord and having reverence for God. That What does it mean? That awesome uh, reverence of the Lord. That's what the fear of the Lord is. And the world has reverence for nothing. They don't have, they don't have a reverence for marriage. They don't have a reverence for babies and life. They don't have a reverence for, um, for just common courtesy caring for people, much less 
for people that believe in God or the godly or the word of God. There's no reverence. It's an irreverent world, so irreverent concerning God or Jesus Christ or the things of God. They'll mock Christians and mock the fact that we're born again and that we love the Lord. We've got the entertainment world. We've got social media. We've got the music world. And it's all designed to mock the things that are holy and pure and God himself who is holy and pure. And so it's just, and, and then notice here in this passage, I'm not going to get real deep into it but because we're running out of time, but look at this. It, it uses the word, I love the adjectives here. Are you looking at the adjectives? Pure and clean. I love that. Associated with God's word, right? It's perfect. It's right. It's pure. It's clean, it says here in Psalm 19. And you know, I love Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, because it talks there about being washed with the water of the word. And see, that's what we need in the irreverent. And sometimes you feel dirty. I don't know about you. I can, there can be commercials on TV that are so, um, how should I say, just crass. And they're dirty. You know, I mean, even my grandkids notice it. Um, some of the things that they're advertising for um, certain body parts and sexual things. And my grandkids, a bit, they go, ah! You know, it's like, oh, you know, whoa. That's in between just regular, you know, not necessarily any bad movie. They just kind of put it out there. Listen, we are living in a vile, filthy environment. And we need to be washed, Paul said in Ephesians. And I, I know that's the context of marriage and husbands and wives. But we all need to be washed with the water of the word. See, it cleans us up, doesn't it? It helps my mind to get all cleaned up, <laughs> right? And that's true because we just live in the, the society that we live in. It's just incredibly vile. I, I, it's just, it's an amazing thing how far we've gone. And you know, I mean, I have, I have my, you know, my parents are in their 80s and they're both still alive. And many of you have parents. I was <laughs> talking to one of the sisters Sunday morning and her mom is... Um, uh, 97. She's almost in. She's. I think she's going to hit 100 because she has uh, several in her family that are going to hit, hit 100. And we've just got some healthy people, right? <laughs> we can't help them. It's just DNA, right? But when you look at when our grandparents were young, or when we ourselves were young, it's gone so far down, so fast as far as just the incredible filth that these that our children and grandchildren have to deal with, and they see it every day. And, and you know with and with the and it's a blessing to have technology I'm thankful for technology I love all the stuff that we have but you know when the kids get that iPhone in their hand especially even the kids of Christian uh, if they're kids of Christian parents it's tough but at least they've got wonderful godly parents that are monitoring it but think of the kids that don't have Christian parents they've got pornography in one second one second and I didn't want to, when I, I can't even verbalize What's, what they look at, to the point of even kids in grade school now, it's not that they know about the birds and the bees, they know about all the perversities of man, and you know what I'm talking about, I didn't want to say it, it's filth, and they know about that at nine, eight, seven years old, because their parents don't know the Lord, they're not watching out for them, right, and so they know all about those things, From this is the world we're living in, so see, how much more that we need to be washed and cleansed by this precious, pure, holy word of God. Amen. It's pure. I love that. And it's clean. I, it even uses the word clean. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, I need to be clean in my mind, Lord. I need that so much. And so it's beautiful. So the fear of the Lord is clean enduring forever the ordinance of the lord they're true and righteous altogether more to be desired are they than gold yes than much fine gold sweeter than the honey and the honeycomb how beautiful is that verse they're valuable what is this talking about the word of god is more valuable than our bank accounts 
It's more valuable to us than my car. It's more valuable, which might not be really good in some cases, because <laughs> I did not have a good car most of, most of my married life. But let me think. It's more valuable than our jewelry. <laughs> it's more valuable than anything. God's word is the most valuable thing that we have, more than gold itself, it says here. How beautiful this is. All of God's statutes, his ordinances, his commandments, every part of the word is valuable to us. It's, 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 it's irreplaceable. I, don't, I can't even think of a great word. It's irreplaceable, isn't it? Nothing does for me what the God's word does for me. Nothing. Nothing does for me what the Bible does for me. I, I was talking to Dan about this on Saturday at a break, and we were talking about it. I said, you know, because, you know, he's a little bit older than Roger and me, <clears throat> but I started reading the Word a long time ago. <laughs> and let me tell you something. I've read through it, and some portions, you know, it's just like you could almost recite it because you know what I mean. You've read it so often, you know, or the pages are so worn because you've read that portion so much. But, you know, as long as I've read it and as much as I've studied it and looked at it and not as much as some people I know, believe me, I, you know, I'm not all that. I'm this much. <laughs> I'm not even a speck, right? But as much as I've read of it, and this is what I was sharing with him on Saturday, it never gets old. It never, ever, ever gets old. It's still, I'm still in wonder when I read it. You know, do you feel that way? There are certain times when you're reading the word and you come across a promise or a truth and you're, you're, maybe you've read it a thousand times and yet I wonder at it. I just have to stop and I'm in, I'm in awe, you know. It just, it never gets old. There are times when I'm reading the word and I know you guys are thinking the same thing I am right now. It's like, I'll just start to cry. It just touches me so deeply, his love or his, his description of something or some account Something that he did for the children of Israel or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego or, you know, um, the disciples as they were following him and he, was, he hadn't ascended yet, you know, and some miracle that occurs and you'll just start to cry because you see the love, <laughs> you know, and so all of this is in the word or I'll get so excited and, and I'll rejoice, that rejoicing of my heart that Jeremiah talked about, right? And it's like, it never gets old. It's a wonder to me. This book is just, it just... It's an amazing book, and I, I just, I still, still just get just excited and, and the wonder of what he says to me in it. It's just the most beautiful thing to have God's word. So see, it's irreplaceable. It's wonderful. It's so valuable. It's more valuable than, the, than a treasure sh chest full of jewels. We used to go into that little, we were at Disneyland for Jacob's birthday, and we went into the Pirates of the Caribbean with a one of the most favorite things Andrew used to do when we would come out of Pirates of the Caribbean ride in that gift shop. Of course, not now with, with, with the COVID and hygiene and all that that we were doing. But they had this, if you'll remember, this chest. And in the chest, there were all these jewels. I mean, just, and the kids could come up. You could buy them, you know, just to take home some. But you could, you could come up and just kind of, and Andrew would say, ooh, the jewels. <laughs> the jewels. And he'd put his hands through his little chubby hands through it and just go like this, you know, and they just fall over, you know, and everything. And kids are just, you know, it's like, they're, they're, it's just like a fantasy thing, you know, oh, the jewels, you know, and see, that's, it's, it's like, God's word is more valuable. Actually, it talks about in Proverbs how that wisdom is more valuable than rubies, <laughs> you know. And here, the word of God, of course, the word is wisdom. And then here, and Jesus is wisdom. And here, he says, the, the word is more valuable than gold. <laughs> you know, it's just like so valuable. And that's how I feel. It's like there's never a time that I open the word that it doesn't penetrate me. It doesn't give me something for the day, for the moment. It just gives me encouragement and the sweetness and the comfort. Sometimes it'll just comfort me, right? And then it'll wash us. It's just the most wonderful thing. So the word of God is more valuable than gold and it's sweeter than honey. They didn't have sugar in David's day. You couldn't go down and buy a box of CNH sugar, could you? They didn't have that. You know what the sugar was? It was honey. It was honey. And if you were here a few years back for the um, uh, event where we had it was sweeter than honey was the theme. We talked about all the medicinal uh, purposes and the medicinal um, beautiful things that honey does for you. It's, it fights certain kinds of cancer. Honey is one of the most healthy things you can eat. 
I mean, it's a very healthy, healthy thing. And so, and it tastes good. On top of it all, it's sweet. And so here, you can get the idea here. It's sweeter than honey. So it's, so what does it do? Let's think about it. It fights spiritual junk diseases in our life, right? But it's also sweeter than honey. In other words, it tastes so good. It, and what else? Have you ever had a sweet tooth? I had a sweet tooth today. <laughs> and so I went, of course, you know, I'm not supposed to have them in my house. Two things I really should not keep in my house. One are my little tea biscuits because I love those. But that's not what I'm talking about. Um, dates. I love dates. And so <laughs> for about the last couple of weeks, I've had dates in my house. Big mistake. And so I just had this sweet tooth. And so I thought, okay, I've got enough calories left. I'm going to have some uh, 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 Hobani yogurt. You know, I like Greek yogurt. So I was going to get some yogurt. And so the yogurt, okay, the yogurt was almost gone. And so it's had like a little bit in the bottom. So I thought, you know what? How can I make that a little bit better? I have a sweet tooth. So I took tea biscuits, crushed them, and then I got like five dates. Pop those things in there. That was the best thing ever. Made that yogurt taste so much better. Because <laughs> I had sweetness, right? I had a sweet tooth. And you know what? After I ate it, I was satisfied. And see, that's what happens with God's word. It satisfies us, right? It's sweeter than honey. I love that. So it's sweeter than honey. It's more valuable than gold. Moreover, by them, the word, the scriptures, moreover, by them is thy servant warned. And in keeping of them, there is great reward. Amen? There's a big reward in, in knowing the scriptures and keeping the scriptures. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me. From secret faults. Does this remind us of Psalm 139, you guys? Remember Psalm 139? Ah! <laughs> that was like a, that was a toughie, wasn't it? <laughs> that he knows everything all the time. Remember what David said? That God, you know me inside and out. We talked about Jeremiah, how the heart is deceitful above all things and everything. Well, here, this kind of reminds, this portion of Psalm 19 kind of reminds me of that, right? And so it says here, hey, cleanse me. I need cleansing from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Those are the sins that are intentional. Those are the sins that can dominate. You know, it's really, um, it's, uh, it's an amazing, it's, he says here, keep me from presumptuous, he says, now first he says, keep me from secret faults, right? Psalm 139 said, there is nothing secret from the Lord. He knows it all. And then though, he says something else. He says, keep your servant also from presumptuous sin. Keep me, and what is that? Presumptuous sin speaks of those intentional sins that can dominate us. Because if you've ever had anybody in your family or shared with a precious friend that you love so much, and they've gotten themselves involved with drugs or alcohol or pornography or some kind of sexual perversion, those things dominate. And it is, it's a different thing. And I know all sin is sin, don't get me wrong. And I know the blood of Christ can cleanse, and that's it. I, I understand that. But those kinds of sin, those presumptuous sins, they make that person, in a very unique way, a slave. And they can't get out of it. And so here, this is kind of what he's getting at. Lord, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Wow. And that, then shall I be upright, and then I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Boy, David. And, of course, David sinned a lot, didn't he? So he, he could kind of talk about this stuff, couldn't he? Because he sinned a lot. And then, of course, I love this. And this is his prayer. This is David's prayer, right? This is the most beautiful prayer. In fact, why don't we just all read it together, right? He says here in verse 14, let's read it. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Isn't that beautiful? I love that. And, and all of this, I love what he says, too, about just the, the reward, the reward of living a godly life. You know, there's a reward with that. When we are obedient to the statutes and the ordinances in his word of God, there is a reward to that. Dan mentioned it at the conference. Let's, I just want to read it to us. You want to hear the reward? Psalm 1. Oh, how happy. We've got a happiness, right? Oh, how happy is the woman who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but her delight, where is it? 
It's in the law of the Lord, the word. And in his word, does she meditate day and night? And here's the reward. Look at this. There's a benefit. There's a blessing. You get something for it. If we do this and we just say, yes, Lord, I want to do all of this. Look what we get. We get something for it. Look at this. And we, you and me, we shall be like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season and its leaf shall not wither and whatever we do is going to prosper. That's a benefit. Amen? Whatever we do, whatever we do. Now, it doesn't say we're never going to have a trial. But let me tell you something. He does say whatever we do. And I can tell you, even in the valley, <laughs> even in the trial, he's present with us. And whatever we do, even in the trial, if we're walking with him and wanting to, and just doing what the word says, we're going to prosper even in the trial. Now, we might not get out of it when we want to, and it might not end up the way I want it to. But you know what I do find in the trial? I have his presence. I have true joy. Maybe I'm shedding some tears and the little happiness thing ain't there but I've got the joy of the Lord way down. Amen? So see, whatever we do, it's, it's such a deal. You guys like good deals? What a bargain. Amen? We get something for it. So praise God. Lord, we just thank you for tonight. Thank you for this song. And Lord, we love you. We love your word. We're excited about your word. And Holy Spirit, we just want to ask you to bring back everything that we had in the lesson, that we did at home, that we heard tonight, that we discussed in the groups, that, Lord, we want to give you permission, Holy Spirit, to just kind of tap us on the shoulder and bring it back to us each and every day. And, Lord, we thank you for the wonder of your word. In Jesus' name, amen.